When I got back to the game, I was getting very upset and confused. I thought about the way the monster looked at me. They couldn't have heard what I said. That's impossible. It had to be a random occurrence. But why did it happen precisely at the moment I insulted the monster? Nothing about this game made any sense. New Godzilla monsters, the weird replacement monsters, out of place imagery like the green temples, quiz levels, and great red monster chases didn't seem to add up in any kind of meaningful way. If it was a prank, it wasn't funny in any way I could understand. They clearly put far too much effort into it. They were trying to make a genuine sequel of New Godzilla monsters, then why did they add everything else? Maybe it was some sort of art experiment? Some group projects made by a bunch of really talented and crazy people and they lost the cartridge somehow? Maybe they attempted it for some random person to find it? It was all just fruitless guessing. As far as I could tell, there was only one way to figure out what the old game was. To play it to the end. Maybe, just maybe, there would be something in the credits, an explanation by the creators as to why they made this. Or maybe it would be something much more cryptic and strange. Maybe even something horrifying. Before I got a good look at the adventure board, I considered replaying Trance to see if the red monster would look at me again, but I decided against it. I wanted to keep moving forward. I was also somewhat worried that backtracking might cause the game to become even more strange. The adventure board music sounded a lot like the Saturn music, except it was slowed down and played with a piano with a sounding instrument. Like most of these new map themes, it had a dangerous Suspenseful feel. While listening to the music, I looked at the dimension board. There are four boss monsters this time Space Godzilla, Amanda, Gigan, and Barrygon. I was surprised that there were two new Tohu monsters this time, but the best surprise was still to come. I started the quiz level. Here's another list of the results in the same form as the last one Can you swim? Answer Yes. You like fish? Answer, yes. Can penguins fly? Answer, no. Can it spin in all directions? There's no clarification of what face meant by it, so I just guessed. Answer, no. You breathe oxygen? Answer, yes. Does it taste good when you bite a woman? I don't know who came up with this question, but I really hope they're getting mental help. Answer, no. Is it night where you are? Answer, yes. Do you like cats? Answer, yes. Is water wet? Answer, yes. Have you ever broken a bone? Answer, no. Do you like your job? Answer, yes. Would you like a new monster? Answer, yes. I wasn't entirely sure at the time what fate meant by the new monster, but I couldn't resist answering yes just to see what would happen. The result was mind-blowing. The game took me back to the border that I had a new playable monster in the form of Anguirus. Ever since I was a kid, I always wanted to play as Anguirus, since he was my second favorite Godzilla monster. Plus, I never liked Mothra all that much. I moved my new Anguirus piece over to the level right next to it, eager to test out my new monster. So before I got to the level description, I'll talk about Angurius a bit. Using the up and down buttons, you can choose whether Angurius stood in a bipedal stance or crawled around on all fours. It wasn't a huge difference, but being able to stand was helpful in boss fights, and crawling sometimes helps dodge the obstacles and attacks. You can punch and kick like Godzilla, but no tail whip. Instead, he had something far more interesting. The ability to curl up into a spiked ball of death and roll around could still take damage, but was lessened. It's a good way of clearing out stage enemies, but unfortunately doing this always also drained the power bar. But the spike ball was in his only special ability. When he pressed start, he would fire a beam of energy from his mouth. It resembled Titanosaurus' sonar attack. If it were a hack, it may have been inspired by the roar attack from Atari's Godzilla fighting games. Also of note was when playing as Angurius, the level meter gets glitched up. Judging by the life and power bar, I'd say he's on level 10. Now on to the level. As you might have guessed from the level icon, these levels are green palette swaps of the ground and background tiles from the Blue Mountain. But what immediately caught my attention was the water, which had a transparency effect. 
Was that even possible for an NES game? I know the Super Nintendo could do it, but I'd never seen a transparency effect on an NES. The Green Mountain's music was played with the same instrument as the Blue Mountains, but the melody was totally different. It was a very simple song with a lot of abrupt pauses, followed by a loud note every few seconds. Anyway, I went through the usual strolling through the level, and again there were no monsters or anything, but pretty soon I reached a cliff above the water. There was nowhere to go but into the water, so down I went. Water transparency made things a bit hard to see, but it's tolerable. After going underwater, I encountered two new enemies, a giant piranha and some kind of spiky bottom feeder thing. I liked the piranha because I could easily tell it was. It was the same enemy design that would appear in a real game, and there were very few enemies like this. They didn't take much hits to kill, but they were quite annoying and could considerably trim down your life if they got close enough. They also tend to travel in packs. As for the bottom feeders, they're easy to deal with. They swim along the bottom of the screen towards you, and they're easily crushed with a roll attack or jumped over. In this screen cap, you can see me about to run one of them over, and there's piranha behind it. After I beat that level, I moved Godzilla onto the blue castle icon. I started the level and got a title screen with a text. The level itself looked like a castle dungeon made out of blue bricks with rows of identical white statue faces on the walls. These statue faces had a permanent look of horror on their faces. There's also some flickering gray static which didn't really obscure my vision, but it adds to the very unsettling mood of these levels. The music was a 12 second loop of low pitched choir vocalizing and it sounded very familiar to me. Whenever I played through one of these levels I get this sudden horrible feeling of anxiety. I had the feeling that the farther I progressed through the level, Closer I was getting to some unspeakably evil. There weren't any enemies, but these were some of the longest levels in the game. I only played one level, but it took seven minutes to complete. I didn't want to admit it to myself at the time, but I realized something playing the Blue Castle level. This game has the power to make the player feel certain things. I don't mean in the sense that you get irritated playing a crappy game or get unnerved by something scary in a game. What I mean is that certain events in this game can instantly make you start feeling something. I, I know that sounds completely insane. I don't blame you for not believing me. I wouldn't believe any of it even if I didn't play the game myself. But there's something very, very wrong with this game. I still don't know how to explain it. So... Then it was time to fight Barragon's replacement. Although Barragon was originally the smallest monster in the game, his replacement was the largest. It was so tall, in fact, that the ground was noticeably lowered, and not Barragon's head still barely avoided collision with the bar at the top of the screen. And he was just as frightening with bizarre as he was huge. You may be wondering how he attacks without arms. Well, he has the most powerful kicks in the game. But his other fighting technique is much stranger. First, he blasts a cloudy breath of pixels down at you, which causes you to freeze. Then he walks back to the right corner of the screen and extends the huge Gatling gun from his abdomen. That might seem amusing to you, but it certainly wasn't to me when I was playing the game. This attack is almost as annoying as Gideon's saw, and not Paragon would have been unbeatable if he consistently used it. Thankfully, he only did it twice when I was fighting him. Once you unfreeze, you can run up and start damaging the gun, which does extra damage to him. This helped me destroy him. It was the time to play the third level type. I decided I was going to use Angurius to fight Man and Gigong, and then, and then fight Space Godzilla as Godzilla. It was only fitting. Before getting into the battles, I'll describe the third level type. 
the Arctic. The Arctic is exactly what you'd expect from the name, an icy tundra with a few watery segments. The music reminded me a bit of northern hemispheres from Donkey Kong Country in 8-bit form. A very dangerous sounding song it made me think of being trapped in a tundra and freezing to death. There are two new enemies in this stage. The first was a creature frozen in a block of ice. You block your way and you have to use the heat beam to thaw them out of the ice. They look a bit like a small version of Nakazora, only without the eye. When free, they do a strange crawling movement and push you backwards. It doesn't cause any damage, but it's a bit annoying. After dealing with the Iceman, I kept walking for a minute or two and came upon a water segment. I jumped in, and this time I managed to get a screen cap showing how the water splashes when you jump in. That one I don't know how they pre that, but it's pretty impressive. Another interesting thing is how the screen changes focus when you go underwater. Here you can see the other new enemy, a thing I call Spike Walker. They walk towards you and explode randomly or instantly if you attack them, sending spikes in every direction. Spikes do, don't do much damage, but they did get me dangerously close to falling into a pit a few times. Oh, speaking of the pits, down into the water the game has a platformer element, bottomless pits. There weren't any of these in the original game since it was strictly an action game, but the pits were a neat addition. After getting back on land, I encountered a very unexpected mini boss, Magma, Walrus Kaiju. I knew this game had some obscure monsters to begin with, but wow, not that I can play it, it's a pretty cool cameo for an underappreciated Kaiju. Magma's tactics were very simple. He had a freeze beam and he could charge into you. Not very challenging, but certainly more entertaining than the Matango mini boss in the original game. One really interesting thing about Magamo is he doesn't die when you defeat him, he turns tail and retreats. It's the first time I'd ever seen an enemy monster change direction, let alone retreat. I tried to chase after him, but he disappeared after I got in the water. Poor bastard. And that does it for the Arctic. I'll talk about the Manda fight next. I forgot to mention before, but the music that they played during the new monster fights is reused from themes actually in the games. So far, the themes have been Titanosaurus, Gizora's music, Biolanti, Adora's music, Orga, Baragon, and Megura's music, Manda, Varan's music, and Space Godzilla, Mecha Godzilla's music. As for the fight, Manda was a fairly crafty opponent. When it realized one tactic was ineffective, it would immediately change to a different one. Manda used quite a few tricks, like spitting fire, biting, the most irritating of all, constricting. It doesn't mercilessly drain your life down like Egan's cutter, but is by far Amanda's strongest attack. One last thing to note that I found pretty cool was that the Atragon showed up during the fight to help me out. Amanda crushed it with ease, but it was still cool. After I slayed Amanda, I played through an Arctic level for health power ups, and was on to Gigan's replacement. When the fight started, I was very confused because there was nothing there. I thought there was going to be like Titanosaurus's fight in Parthos, but just about the time it would have been going back to the map, a piranha appeared on screen. But it wasn't there for long. As soon as it appeared, the speakers emitted an ear splitting screech, and Nat Keegan flew in and ripped the four fish to pieces. That's one way to get the player on the toes. The abrupt entrance scared the hell out of me and got my adrenaline rushing, which I suspect was a good thing, because Nakigan was one of the fastest, most unrelenting opponents in the game. Nakigan was tough, but my new skills with Angurus helped to even the score. It was still an incredibly intense fight! Nakigan's attack consisted of some kind of blood laser he spews through his mouth and a downward slash. I was expecting some hellish variant of the buzzsaw attack, but thankfully there didn't seem to be one. The Howl attack was invaluable in defeating him. I would have taken more screen caps of the fight, but I really had to concentrate. After that, there was only one monster to take there. Space Godzilla. As mentioned earlier, I used Godzilla for this fight. Space Godzilla's technique was rather frustrating, but admittedly a very clever idea. Space Godzilla would use his energy to create two flying crystals, which would reach the ground and become crystal spires. These spires not only block you from reaching Space Godzilla, but it also allows him to constantly recharge his energy. 
blast you with a deadly fully charged corona beam until you broke the spires. Space Godzilla would eventually drain his own spires of energy until they shattered. If you waited for that to happen, you'd probably lose a lot of life. Heat beams actually seemed to re-energize the spires, so you had to use physical attacks. When you finally got close enough to hit Space Godzilla, he was no pushover. When I punched him, he hit me back just as hard. Space Godzilla does everything in his power to knock you back to the left corner of the screen so he can create more spires. By the time this was over, I only had about five life bars left. But it didn't matter because I didn't need to fight anymore. I needed to run. Here we go again. It's like right there that I really wanted to see the end of this game. As terrifying as these levels could sometimes be, I had to beat them to get through. Inside, no matter what happened, no matter what the game showed me, I was going to get to the end. I also made sure not to say a damn word while playing the chase level from here on. For this chase, I tried out Angurus, since his roll attack allowed me to move faster than Godzilla or Mothra. The chase started off like the first two, except there was a river of blood below the ground. I was beginning to get the hang of it, and the extra speed from the roll helped me get an edge on the red monster. Especially since I didn't have to worry about the power limit, I could keep rolling endlessly. Like the previous levels water, the ground inevitably reached a stop, so I rolled off into the blood. To my surprise, the beast didn't follow after me, it just stopped at the edge of the ground and grimaced. Guess I can't swim, I thought to myself. So I went under blood and continued moving. There was nothing around, but I knew something was up. Chase wasn't going to go that easily, could it? Surely something else had to show up, and sure enough, I heard the bellowing roar, sounding slightly different. The monster was following after me, a new aquatic body! I had no idea it was a shapeshifter. After it reappeared, the chase started to get into the difficulty I'd expected. Being submerged slowed me down, putting me and the beast at about the same speed. The only thing that kept me alive was fast thinking and reflexes. I encountered some bottomless pits in which mines floated up from. I assume if you hit one, it would damage you and knock you back. Considering how fast the red monster swims, hitting the monster would be an instant death, so I went through great effort to avoid them. But that wasn't all I had to be wary of. Halfway through the chase, the hell beast revealed yet another surprise. A tentacle formed of intestine and tipped with a clawed set of jaws burst from its mouth, trying to pull me in, devour me. I only barely avoided both the tentacle and the mines, but I could tell the beast was getting desperate because the chase was nearly over. And about a minute later, I had spotted the bit of ground that served as the exit. I reached with all the weight I could muster without breaking my controller. The beast screamed with rage and jumped out of the blood river in one last attempt to drag me down. But I escaped his grasp. This time. I fell back on my bed and took a deep breath. Satisfied with yet... Another successful escape. Now, I was headed to the fifth world.